Welcome to Butterflies Advisory, I'm Dan Danaher and with me today I've got Crispin Holloway, the species champion for the Adonis Blue Butterfly in Sussex. Hi Crispin. Hi Dan. So where have you brought me to today? Okay, we're at Mauling Down, Sussex Wildlife Trust Preserve, here in Lewis. It's a really great site for Adonis Blues, particularly the hillside behind us. And you should be able to see quite a good number of them now, May, June. And then there'll be the second generation in August, September, when there'll be even more around. So, Fantastic. Yeah. So if we miss it, if anyone misses it now, they can come later on. That's right. Fantastic. Well, I can't wait to get up there. Okay, let's go. So you brought me, Crispin, up here to see some enclosures. What's that all about? Right. The areas behind us have been fenced off. Um, one fenced off from rabbits and sheep. So there's absolutely no grazing whatsoever and hasn't been there for about five years. And the other is fenced off to sheep only. So the rabbits can get in and graze. Therefore, we can man uh, monitor whether the rabbits and sheep are having any impact, how good the impact is, and um, what it would be like if there was no grazing. And so we, we do, I've, I've come here to talk to you about a butterfly, uh, but you're talking to me about sheep and rabbits grazing. Um, what's the connection? Well, the management of the site is really important. Um, without the grazing, the, you wouldn't have the microclimates, you wouldn't have the appropriate habitat. It's really important for the sward height to be short for Dennis Blue to get that warmth that it needs. What we've got here is a perfect example of what habitat can be like. I mean, if I get out of my pocket here, a little thermometer, we'll see that down here it is 32.8. Now if I go somewhere where it's longer, let's just say up here, and 23.2. Well, that's quite a difference. So if I put my hand there, yeah, I can really feel it's nice and warm. If I put my hand up there, it's really quite cool. I and mean, that is going to be absolutely crucial for a firmly constrained butterfly such as Donus Blue, which is at its northernmost limit of its European range. Well, Crispin, it's incredible. What a difference. We're right down the bottom of the hill now. It's a shorter sward. There's hardly any wind here because we're sheltered. Mm -hmm. And it's so much warmer. Mm. It's hot. Much yeah. hotter. And uh, it's more than it's blues around. Yeah, down exactly. Here. I mean, it's very easy to become distracted by them because they're flying all around us at the moment. Yeah. yeah. So um, tell me now, one of the things I did notice was that the males seem to be whizzing around all over the place, obviously looking for females. Mm -hmm. And the females are, are, are flying a lot lower around. What do you think they're up to? Um, they're probably seeking out suitable host plants, horseshoe vetch, where they can lay their eggs and also they're going to be want to be nice and warm so as to prepare their eggs is before any, laying. Is there any difference between what the spring brood, this brood now does, uh, uh, in comparison to the later brood in the summer? Yeah, I mean the spring brood, they can tolerate longer areas of grassland um, and would be less fussy. Why? Whereas, well, you got the nice warm sun, yeah, and that's okay. They oh, need during the summer, it's during warmer. the summer, yeah. right? I got you. Yeah, yeah. So, so the, the, the height of the sward isn't such a big deal during the summer. No. So these ones lay their eggs now, and it's better in the summer, right? I yeah. got you. I mean, they are fussy, but yeah. yeah. But the second generation, those that would be laying their eggs in August, September, they'd be much more fussy. They'd want it to be a host plant which is in area of broken ground. It's going to get maximum sun. Right. They're more fussy. They okay. can't tolerate long length of grass. I see. Yeah, that's too long. Right. So this is all about the caterpillar, isn't it? Isn't that the, yeah. the, the, the stage that it sees through the winter? Yes. And it's also going to be tended by ants. Oh, yes. Now, uh, as you know, uh, earlier on in the year, Colin Knight and I went to the A27 cutting. I must say, really inspired by the video that you put on the Facebook page for Butterflies of the Biosphere. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we found that amazing. Uh, you just look for the ants yeah. and then you find the, the caterpillar. So this species goes through the winter as a caterpillar. Mm -hmm. And it's quite a remarkable insect, isn't it? Because you've already spoken to me about how vulnerable it is uh, to pathogens like moulds and fungi. But it has something on its side, doesn't it? The ants. Ants, yeah. yeah. We're just going to protect it um, and clean it as well. Guard it. They're going to sort of really look after it with the reward of the sugary solution. 
I've always thought about the fact that it gives out this sugary, sugary solution through the honey gland and therefore mm -hmm. the ants will get rid of any uh, predators like spiders yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. But until this very moment, it's never occurred to me, that the licking of the whole body, mm -hmm. which of course is what they do because the larva secretes this stuff all over, well at least not the, the honeydew, but the pheromones are all over its body. There's a real mechanism there, isn't it? You've just made me realize that's all about getting rid of spores of fungi and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Just here, it's perfect. You can see the amount of horseshoe vetch. It's short, uh, it's nice and warm. It's quite sheltered at the moment. You can see the dense blues just going over the surface and um, it's just right. So, in preparation for coming out of it here today, I uh, read Jeremy Thomas and uh, Richard Lewington's mm -hmm. book, fantastic book. Yeah, really Vampires and British Isles, yeah. However, um, there are certain things about the statement for the Adonis Blue which I have difficulty with. And one of them is this insistence that the butterfly doesn't move very far. Yeah, um, colonies are close-knit, um, fairly localised, where they can be quite good, strong populations, quite yeah, good. But they don't generally fly over barriers, for example, trees, scrub, unsuitable habitat or ploughed fields, agricultural land. Um, I, they will, they will go so far, but not that far. So yeah. having, Sorry, yeah. that, that sort of flies in the face of what we know has happened, doesn't it? Because in the 70s they were really restricted, we thought it was going to yeah. go extinct. Yeah. And yet it's expanded its range massively. Yeah, I mean that's very much as a result of um, improved grazing right the way across the South Downs, as well as um, the efforts of various uh, conservation organisations, including Butterfly Conservation, Sussex Wildlife Trusts and so on. Um, but having little, little stepping stones right. um, can be really important. I mean, like the, the um, Butterfly Haven. Well, I mean, that's an example. Yeah. I mean, you had them there, what's it? Two or three years after you well, created I think it. it was, I think it was 18 months, actually. Oh, right, okay. 18 months after yeah. we created it. So they came from somewhere nearby. And as far and as we're aware, the nearest colony was two kilometres away. Yeah. So, the, uh, my gut tells fertile, me. fertile female? Yeah. My gut tells me that maybe they don't move very far if it's not a particularly good year. But if you yeah. have a bumper year, and you have had some bumper years yeah. here, haven't you? Yeah. If you have a bumper year, then all of a sudden, then there's the, there's a there's a inbuilt mechanism, perhaps, Mm -hmm. Because they they can sense their own population density, yep. off they go. Maybe it's like you know males being were having to work too hard for females, females bashing into too many males, too much competition. Yeah, and that may be the stimulus, and yeah. then that's when maybe they they go, yeah. and that would account for how they get from one site to another, and yet also account for the observations that Thomas and Simcox recorded when they were looking at the movements of the species from one site to another, or not. Yeah, yeah. I mean, certainly in very good years here at Morning Down, I'd occasionally find males and females in the north-facing pits. Right. And, um, wow, gosh, how did they get here? Yeah. Well, they've flown right over the top. Yeah. Um, because the pits are fairly flat and very sheltered, if there's some horseshoe vetch there, they could potentially breed over there. Yeah. Although it's north-facing, yeah. it's warm enough. And we also have, of course, something that's on their side now, climate change. Yeah, I mean that could benefit Adonis Blues and their dispersal to a degree, but n not quite in the same way as it would with, uh, well has done, with Silver Spotted Skipper. Um, they're not that great at sort of going over these barriers, as I said. Um, and their host plant, Horseshoe Vetch, has got to be there. Yeah. So you were saying that uh, the a species might be restricted by its host plant distribution, mm. um, and in the case, I guess, in the, the silver spotted skipper, there's a species which has got uh, Festuca vina just about everywhere yeah. on the chalk grass, and so it's not difficult for it to move. But we're talking about a species here, uh, which is which is fairly early to mid successional species, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, which and, and I, th I tend to think it's of it as more of an early successional species because it came in so quickly to the butterfly haven at uh, Dorothy yeah. Stringer. Um, sorry, I've got a beetle on me. Um, That's nice. Yeah. <laughs> well, it is. Yes. That's what it's all about, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> um, so, 
really all we're waiting for is the host plant to establish itself. And the host plant won't establish itself unless either there's some disturbance mm -hmm. or someone's deliberately... It's introduced. Yeah. 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 So that's what we're waiting for. That, I think, is probably more of a limiting factor for yeah. this species to move from one habitat to the next. Yeah. I mean, so getting seed and creating suitable habitat, even in your own garden, um, is a help. You were telling me on the telephone about a, mm. a situation at, at your house. What could you repeat that? Well, it was actually my father's house. I mean, um, since the 1960s, um, there's been suitable chalk grassland where he's managed it, and now I'm doing that, um, for chalk grassland species. And sometime in the 1980s, the Chalk Hill and Adonis Blues colonising, and they've been there every year since. Mm. And occasionally, and it really amazes me, we get them coming down to shoe vetch plants, which are grown as ornamental plants, because they're just wonderful. This native species have as an ornamental plant in the front garden, yeah. in a pot. They'd come down and they'd find it. I mean, how on earth did they get all over those trees and round and find that? That's because you've accepted the, 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 well, the accepted wisdom. You've accepted that. Yeah. yeah but I, my, my, my gut tells me, time and time again, like I said in our last edition on the small blue, these animals have wings. They can fly. Well, yeah. yeah you know, and, and, and they've got noses. They've got these antennae. So if they can sense it's there, these, uh, the plants are throwing out secondary metabolic compounds into the atmosphere all the time. Yeah. It's a big lure, isn't it? Yeah. So I don't quite buy this business about the fact that they don't fly over borders. Yeah, they might be, th but their individual behaviour might, might be deflected by that when they're not on a mission I to go. I think they're far more plastic than you'd expect. They, they've got capability of going somewhere when they want to, when they know, yeah. well, not when they know. But, but when they feel. Yeah. yeah. There's a, but there's a lot of anecdotal evidence now with lots of butterflies, the pearl border fertility, for example. Mm -hmm. That's cropping up wherever there is yeah. suitable habitat. Yeah. I'm, yeah. Well, uh, Crispin, we've, we've finally got down the bottom here and it's even warmer, this shelter. It's incredible. Nice. That's lovely, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Well, look, I've really, really enjoyed spending time with you in the Donis Blues and, and yeah. the conversation has been fascinating. Mm, it's really interesting. I've enjoyed it too. Great. Well, look, if you want to see the Adonis Blue, uh, then Mauling Down is a fantastic location just near Lewis. Um, we'd love to hear about any records you get on the Adonis Blue. And of course, uh, you can send those either to the Sussex Conservation Butterfly, sorry, the Sussex Butterfly Conservation sightings page or to the Facebook page for Butterflies of the Biosphere. Uh, so until next time, good luck from me and goodbye from <laughs> Crespin. <laughs> <laughs>